Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the virtual Sunshine Week presentation co-hosted by the Pennsylvania Freedom of Information Coalition and the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. I'm Paula Knudsen Burke, the local legal initiative attorney here in Pennsylvania. And it's my pleasure to turn it over first for some welcoming remarks to Katie Townsend from the Reporters Committee. Thanks so much, Paula. Good morning and happy Sunshine Week. As Paula mentioned, my name is Katie Townsend and I'm the legal director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, a national nonprofit organization dedicated to defending the First Amendment and news gathering rights of journalists and news organizations. I'm thrilled to be joining you this morning. As many of you might know, this past year, thanks to a generous investment from the Knight Foundation, the Reporters Committee launched its local legal initiative. The LLI, as you will hear it called, is a new ambitious initiative to provide legal support for local enterprise and investigative reporting in five states across the country, Colorado, Oklahoma, Oregon, Tennessee, and right here in Pennsylvania. The Reporters Committee selected Pennsylvania as one of its initial five LLI jurisdictions following a thorough proposal process where we asked journalists, news organizations, and other stakeholders to tell us why they needed an RCFP attorney dedicated to working in their state. The competition was stiff. We received proposals on behalf of more than 30 states, regions, and territories nationwide. Pennsylvania's submissions highlighted some of the fabulous enterprise and investigative journalism being done at the local and state level by nonprofit and for-profit news organizations, freelance and independent journalists, as well as new and exciting news collaborations. But it also painted a picture of important local stories being stymied, especially by a lack of access to public records under the right to know law. Paula, RCFP's local legal initiative attorney in Pennsylvania, has hit the ground running, providing the kind of help journalists across Pennsylvania need to overcome legal obstacles and tell the stories that are important to their communities. Stories that in some cases, without the backing of an attorney to, for example, push back on denials of right to know law requests, couldn't be covered at all. Given the Reporters Committee's direct commitment to local investigative and enterprise reporting here in Pennsylvania, reporting that depends on transparency and access to government information, I could not be more pleased that the Reporters Committee was able to help co-host this program today to help celebrate Sunshine Week. And with that, I will turn it over to Susan, Susan Schwartz of the Pennsylvania Freedom of, of Information Coalition. Thank you so much, Katie. So welcome everyone to our virtual celebration of Sunshine Week 2021. So the, the Pennsylvania Freedom of Information Coalition was really excited when Paula and the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press asked us to team up with them for this panel. We, we really believe that people have a right to know what their government is doing. So we're dedicated to empowering regular citizens as well as reporters with the tools that they need to get government records, to listen in while government officials are making important decisions and to have a chance to put in their two cents. So the panelists that are gathered today are all public information black belts. We've got top reporters, we've got attorneys and regular citizens who regularly use Pennsylvania and federal law to keep our government operating in the open. They'll share some of their best techniques and they'll talk about their successes and they'll also reflect on what they've learned from some of their defeats. It's going to be an interesting session. So I'd also like to urge you to join us as we continue our efforts to keep Pennsylvania government open. You can find membership forms for our coalition at pafoic.org, along with lots of open government resources. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Paula for our first panel. Thank you so much, Susan and Katie. Um, this really is a great time to celebrate uh, sunshine and why transparency and accountability are important. And we have a lot to pack into the session and a couple housekeeping items. We are recording and we will make the recording available. So if you have to step out and take a call or um, do something else, you'll have this available. We also have a PowerPoint that we've put together um, that we'll send out to you later. And that will have the contact information of each of our panelists, as well as some of their high level points on which they'll be um, speaking and also some, um, some citations to their cases. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our first panel and let me introduce them as they're coming on screen. 
Marissa is with the Quattrone Center for uh, Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Juliet is a mental health reporter with Public Source, a news outlet in Pittsburgh. Harubi Mecco is a data and visualizations reporter at LNP Lancaster. Liz is with the York Dispatch in um, York, Pennsylvania, the York newspaper. And Angela is with Spotlight PA, which is a nonprofit statewide um, collaborative news outlet. So first up, we've got Marissa. And Marissa, I understand you're going to screen share with us and tell us about lessons learned from a huge <laughs> records effort. Can't wait to hear. Yeah, and Paula, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this. I'm hardly a right to know law expert. I'm, in fact, um, what I really kind of hope to do is kind of share lessons about don't do what I did. Um, so, uh, so just as by way of background, so I work at the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at Penn Law. Our organization really is about trying to use data and research to promote reforms within the criminal justice or criminal legal system. My particular area comes in with wrongful convictions, and particularly in conviction integrity issues. Um, so one thing we wanted to try to do was to determine how closely Pennsylvania law enforcement hewed to what we now recognize as best practices in two particular areas. One is eyewitness identification protocols, and the other is in witness, ident witness or suspect interrogations. So we know from years of work that there are certain best evidence practices that police should be using, and we really wanted to know how does Pennsylvania stack up? You know, how, how close are we to where we should be? So what we did wind up doing, and I'll show you in a couple minutes exactly how we did this is, and by we, I mean me, honestly, uh, sent out right to know requests to all of the um, law enforcement agencies in the Commonwealth. And if we had chat capability, I would ask you to put in the chat how many people, you, how many agencies you think that is. Um, because I guarantee you it is more than you think. So nationwide, there are probably about 26,000 law enforcement agencies. The state of California has 600. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, over 1,200. 1,200 law enforcement agencies that we wanted to try to reach out to. We also wanted to, um, needed to make sure it was done within a certain amount of time so that the snapshot would be fair, where if a law enforcement agency were changing their policies or their protocols, we would you know, be able to kind of accommodate for that. We had to make sure that we did it right. So step one was trying to find out the names and contact information of the right to know officers for all of these 1,200, did I say 1,200? 1,200 agencies. So we got, we were able to get a publication called the Blue Book. If you don't know it exists, it does. Um, it's called the Blue Book. It's literally about this big. It's a tiny little pamphlet looking thing. It lists all of the law enforcement agencies in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, um, both from, from sheriffs and constables to DA's offices, detectives agencies, everybody. Then we took that, we, changed, we had to, um, quite frankly, kind of change it into a PDF so we could search it. We had to make that into an Excel spreadsheet, pull from that as best we could all the right to know officers. It turns out that it was easiest for us to fax, which I do not recommend, but we had to fax all of these things all across because that was the easiest way we could do it. So we started, of course, by getting the information, by identifying who we needed to go to, um, and then we put together our requests. This is the cover letter that we used that we went out. I do not recommend doing it this way. So I'm a lawyer. When I put it together, I wanted to be sure to say, you know, um, to try to head off any expected defenses that we would have. So for example, I put in there, you know, we're not looking for your investigative materials. What we're looking for is more akin to the, um, the logs that you keep. So of course, 40% of the people thought I was looking for their logs. They didn't go to the second and third and fourth and fifth pages of this thing. And I had to deal with a lot of questions about that. So don't do what I did on that. The second don't do what I did is probably don't use as strong legal ease as we did. So um, as a lawyer, I'm used to trying to draft things which are overly inclusive. So you'll see here, these are actually five of the six requests that we sent out. Um, I had to explain, I cannot 
even tell you how many times. Really what I'm looking for is information that falls into two buckets, whether it's eyewitness identification protocols or witness um, interviews or interrogations. That's really all we were looking for, but we worded it in such a way to try to head off any objections they might have. Also caused a lot of difficulty with, with the agencies that I was dealing with. Um, so once these went out, then typically I would get lots and lots of phone calls. So you need to be able to track the information and, and who you spoke to, what you told them, um, whether they're going to be getting an extension, whether they're going to be, you know, they don't have anything at all. Um, all those kinds of issues, you have to be tracking that better than I did, which was on a tiny little thing. So another thing, don't do what I do. Don't keep all the phone lists on a tiny little memo pad. Bad idea. Um, so then we had to track the information as it was coming in. So we put together an Excel spreadsheet to try to track all the information. Um, this is from one of the later, uh, you know, failed. This is our failed fax um, sheet, actually. So we track in the agency name, who their OR is, what their email is, um, you know, whether you've had contact, whether there are alternate contacts, and then of course there's just tracking the information itself. Um, when did it go out? Did you get the receipt? When's the response due? Did they invoke an extension? If so, what's the revised date? Did we get a response? When did we receive it? You know, if we didn't get, a, get it, is that an affirmative denial? And when are we filing an our appeal? And then we have a whole separate track for tracking the appeals um, themselves. So it is a lot of data to try to track down um, and try to keep a hold of. So in terms of what I would do differently if I were to do this over, um, I would break it. We'd, we wound up sending out about 200 faxes a week over a series of five weeks. Um, I think that actually was somewhat manageable, but it very, very quickly will kind of spiral out if you're not absolutely diligent about keeping the data um, and what you're doing. Of course, we used a lot of color coding as well to try to track what had come in, what was due, when it was gonna go out. Um, just so you know, the, the black there, that's this agency doesn't exist anymore, so there was a lot of that. Um, and it just takes an incredible amount of planning ahead of time and then follow up with that um, once these things start coming in and then of course coding them, but that's not my department. This was all just about getting the information in. So that's kind of what we did. Um, like I said, I would not recommend doing it the way we did this. So it was really kind of nutty. And I will actually, I have up the entire, if I can just take one more second of your time. So this is actually the spreadsheet um, that we have, which actually is that, I don't think that was, sorry, let me try that again. Um, there we go. So this is literally the actual spreadsheet. You can see down here on the bottom, if you can see, we broke it down into how we, when we sent the um, requests, when they went out. And as I said, they're all kind of color coded. Each color means slightly different thing. Gray means we got it. Green is there's something needs to be followed up on. Yellow is still in progress. Pink was an appeal. Um, yeah, so we had our own system kind of laid out so I can look at this spreadsheet and tell you exactly where the township you know, request is. Um, but that's what we had to do for all of them. And then, of course, we have all the agency contacts now, um, as well as how they're going through. And then at the bottom of each, we tracked the numbers of responses received. And then if there was no response or no response to documents, we were tracking that as well, because that's obviously pretty important for our research, what we were doing. So. Don't do what I did. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna ask you two two follow up questions. Um, sure. and we're going to our next panelist. One, where did you get the little blue book? Where where did you find that? So I literally googled um you know, like law enforcement agencies in Pennsylvania, and then this publication, the Blue Book, came up. Um, and so and I wrote to them. I said I'm a researcher. We work with law enforcement, and and I was able to get a copy that way. We actually had to convert it to PDF so that we could use it, but you know that's how we started it. Okay, and then from Joseph Jafari at Spotlight PA, he says, you explained that you wouldn't recommend a cover sheet preempting arguments and also wouldn't be very specific in what you're looking for. Why? Why would you not recommend being specific and accurate? Um, well, and I- Yeah, go ahead, sorry, Paula. Question, Joseph. Go ahead. So the cover sheet, I don't, it's not that I don't recommend a cover sheet. I just wouldn't do it the way I did it because, you know, when the law enforcement gets it, most of these law enforcement agencies don't have right to know officers. They're very hard to track. So you're often talking to chiefs 
on themselves who run like a four person unit, if that, um, and they just want to be kind of walked through it. So they'll look at the cover sheet and they'll see where I wrote, um, you know, that the logs and they think that's what I'm looking for without going to the set because they're just not used to looking at these things. And as far as the specificity in the requests, um, I think we were too specific in the like we had an including but not limited to that lasted three lines. Um, and I think I would have kept it much simpler that you know, we were looking for protocols for eyewitness identifications, um, as well as witness statements and, and interrogations and kind of left it at that. Uh, so I think we went a little bit too into the weeds on that. Awesome. And can, Marissa, I don't know if you can share the, the uh, blue book that you made. There's a question from the chat. If you can, you can follow up with us later. I, I, we're not allowed to, um, but I can certainly give you the site where we found it. Okay, awesome. All right, next up, and as a reminder, we will have Q&A time for all the panelists at the end, but we are moving here. Marissa, that was fantastic. And I do apologize, I need to duck out, but I will be back. Okay, thank you so much. Up next, we have Juliet Ryle, mental health reporter at Public Source. Juliet. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I have been RTKing a lot of records over the past probably nine months or so now from the Allegheny County Jail. So I'm going to be talking a bit about jail records and what that journey has been like and what I've learned. Um, and I'll be talking about it in the context of two stories mainly. So um, Amelia is going to drop those links in the chat um, once we get to each one. Um, Probably at this point, I think I've done close to 40 or 50 RTKs for the Allegheny County Jail and other jails in Pennsylvania. And one thing that I've learned can be really helpful and useful is to sometimes RTK for mm -hmm. records that you may already have. Um, say you have them from a source, it can still be helpful to RTK for them. One of the reasons is, um, of course, if you need to check uh, the authenticity of the records you were given, um, you can do it that way through the county, which is um, something I did. Also, though, it can be helpful um, to see how transparent the county is or whatever entity you're RTKing in, in providing those things. And that is what we did for a story about the restraint chair recently um, at the Allegheny County Jail. The restraint chair is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a chair that's used to um, restrain people typically when they're having some sort of mental health crisis. And I wanted to figure out a little bit more about how it was used at the jail. So I requested the policy. I had already had the policy from a source, but I wanted to see one, if anything had been updated um, since the version of the policy that I had and two, to see um, how much information the county was really willing to provide. And I was really surprised when I got the, the policy back from the county and it was pretty much entirely redacted. Um, we're talking, you could see the title, you could see the first sentence, but every other page was fully redacted, every single word. So really no information was given. Um, and we actually decided to include that in our reporting. Sometimes those kind of behind the scenes process things aren't that interesting to readers, but that actually, I think, really resonated with folks. And it wound up being a conversation at um, the jail oversight board meeting that week, which is the entity that oversees the jail. So I thought it was worthwhile. Um, and I, I know the link to that story was, was dropped in the chat, so you can check out more about that. So that's RTKing for records that you already have. Another thing I've learned is useful is to use RTKs to compare how transparent different entities or localities are to each other. So we actually did a Sunshine Week story that dropped today that I would love if everyone went to our website to check out. Um, it's publicsource.org. And um, we wanted to see how transparent Allegheny County Jail was with its mental health policies compared to other county jails in the state. So I had requested all the mental health policies from Allegheny County Jail back in September, I believe. And it was the same thing. Of the six policies that they provided, five of them were entirely redacted, um, just pages and pages and pages of redactions. And I thought that was a, a little odd, um, but I, I really needed to find out if other jails were doing the same thing 
So I RTK'd the same records, same policies from the other five largest jails in the state. I believe it was Philadelphia, Montgomery, Bucks, Lancaster, and Delaware counties. And to my surprise, they, they provided a lot more information than Allegheny County. Uh, some provided their policies in full, some had light redactions or moderate redactions on some of the policies, but everyone provided far more information than Allegheny County. Um, and I actually, I had appealed Allegheny County's um, decision to the Office of Open Records, um, but that appeal was denied. So I thought that RTK for the other policies was kind of a good route to, to see just where it stood in terms of transparency among its, its peers. And that was a story that again came out today and it might be of interest to some of you. Uh, and the last thing I learned, um, this probably is not a surprise to a lot of reporters and um, other folks on this call, but records requests are not the be all end all. Uh, I kind of learned this the hard way. I, I got a little too confident in my first couple records requests because I was getting a lot of a lot of them fulfilled. Um, and I quickly learned that, you know, there you're going to be met with varying levels of success for each records request. So um, if you have sources, always try your sources first. Um, if you have other ways of, of getting the records, try those first, um, because the process can be really cumbersome um, and just honestly really time consuming. So um, I, I've kind of learned to, to pivot when necessary. So those are the three things I learned from the jail reporting and happy to take any questions at the end of the conversation. Thank you, Juliet. And I do see a couple other questions coming in. And for those folks, just letting you know, um, I see them, I'm saving them for some other times in the presentation where I think they might make sense. Um, so now we're going to turn to Harubi Mecco. Are you there? There you are, Harubi. Um, tell us about Act 22. Okay, good morning, everyone. And thank you for having me today. Um, I will be talking about my recent foray into the world of Act 22 requests. Um, so Act 22, it's separate from the right to know law, I'm sure many of you know, it's for specifically requesting um, audio and video recordings made by law enforcement agencies. Uh, so you wouldn't go through the right to know law to get a body cam video from a law enforcement agency, you would use Act 22. And just it's separate. So even filing an Act 22 request is a little different in that you are technically supposed to take it in person to whatever law enforcement agency you're trying to get the audio or video from, which was a little interesting the first time I tried it because they had no idea where to send me. So I was sent to like five different buildings, which was fun. Um, but once you submit it, they have you're supposed to submit it also within 60 days of whatever instance your incident you're trying to get the recording for. So for example, um, I submitted my first one for a protest that happened on September 13th after a uh, police shooting of Ricardo Munoz in Lancaster uh, City. So from that day, I had 60 days to submit my Act 22 request. And when you file an Act 22 request, the specifics are also different in that they actually ask for what your relationship is to the incident itself. Um, so when we initially, so going back to the first one we did uh, with a protest back in May, our managing editor submitted it and she was actually at the protest and had gotten pepper sprayed in a clash with the police. So when she submitted her Act 22 request for body camera video, we ended up getting a dump of about 20 hours of 10 different clips and they redacted all sections where there was pepper spray or any kind of incident except for what showed her getting pepper sprayed. So when we, when I submitted mine for an incident that I was asking for as a reporter, uh, we ended up getting denied for it. And we were denied because the agency, the Lancaster City Police and then the um, Lancaster District Attorney's Office actually reviewed and said, no, we have investigations going on, so we were denied. But we were able to appeal uh, with the support of LNP. I was able to appeal. And the appeals process is also different from a right to know request in that it goes straight to the common police court. So you do not go to OR, OOR. It will actually get dismissed if it goes to OOR. You have to take it to the common police court. Um, so our 
argument is that the incident that we are trying to get body camera footage for, it happened on public property, it happened out in the open, and it we have like different camera angles of it, so it should be public. But again, Act 22 became a law in 2017, so according to our attorneys as well, there isn't a lot of precedence and there isn't a lot of case law. Um, and I imagine that that will definitely change as more agencies, small municipalities are getting co cam, uh, body camera video and more reporters will hopefully seek the body camera video from those incidents. So this is really our effort to try to create some, like some, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Awareness. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so there is actually an example of a successful uh, Act 22 request that LMP was able to file with uh, reporter Carter Walker, and it was for, Amelia, could you get the slide up really quickly? But it was for a dash cam video from one of our municipal police departments showing our then president judge uh, having an encounter with a police officer for being pulled over. And Amelia, while you're bringing that up, um... We have a question who says, um, what did the Court of Common Pleas decide? In your PowerPoint that you'll get afterward, you have the link to the docket number in the Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas, it's still pending. So um, the district attorney's office and the city of Lancaster have joined together to say that the newspaper and her Ruby should not get um, the footage and we're watching that play out. So. Um, yeah, that's another thing with Act 22 requests is that if the attorney general's office or if the district attorney's office is also on a case with the local police department, they can jump in or they can be the ones who deny the request. Haruby, I think this is a this is um, actually a different clip, right? This is some footage you obtained through managing um, editor Sadowski's request. Yes. So. For the denial that I got, we were told that the footage was, or the instances where there were clashes with police, where they are being investigated, were too long to edit out. But when they gave us the original one back in from the May incident, they did actually redact full sections and then go back into other pieces. Um, that was that video. Okay. So, and again, you'll have that in your PowerPoint that will go out later. Thank you so much, Haruby. We will keep our eye on that case um, and good luck to you. Next up, we have Liz Evans Skolforo from the York Dispatch. Liz, tell us about your sunshine journey. Good morning. Um, well, I'm here today to share my experience of being ping ponged uh, back and forth between two different agencies, county and judicial. Um, I'm trying to obtain records that nobody disputes are public, um, clearly public information. Uh, last month, the County of York finally released most of that information to me after I first requested it in July, um, but not all of it. So with help from the reporters committee and Paula, uh, the York Dispatch and I have continued to fight for this information. Uh, we went to Office of Open Records, uh, then we went to Common Pleas Court, and we're on our way to Commonwealth Court. Uh, so again, this drawn out business began in July when I filed an RTK request with York County, um, seeking information on all prothonotary employees since January of 2020, when the new prothonotary uh, took office. So I was looking for names, job titles, hourly wages or salaries, and each employee's start and end employment dates. Um, I was denied by the York County solicitor, I was told that those are considered judicial records. Um, I doubted that, but <clears throat> I went to the York County court administrator for the records. He told me he didn't have them because they're county records. So I even asked the sitting York County president judge to uh, wade into this, and he did. And uh, he got back to me, the, told me the same thing the York County court administrator told me. They don't have the records. They don't have control over them. They don't have access to them. So 
Um, that's when uh, Paula appealed on my behalf uh, with OOR. And uh, we were stunned when the appeal was denied, um, not because the information is not public, because the reviewer at OOR said it specifically is, but, but simply because OOR does not have um, authority over judicial records. So um, that's when we appealed to York County Court. And in late January, we lost there too. Um, but the judge in his 24 page opinion um, directed the county court administrator and uh, the York County solicitor to work together to determine what records ought to be released uh, pursuant to what he found in his opinion. So <clears throat> the county court administrator reviewed my request, determined everything was public except the starting and ending dates of employment for each employee. Um, and he sent an email to the county solicitor saying as much <clears throat> uh, and reiterating that the records were, quote, in the possession, control, and supervision of the county, end quote. He also wrote, and I found this interesting, quote, I have not been presented with any authority for the proposition that I can cause or compel the county to actually release or withhold the information, end quote. So he was basically saying, this is not our thing. Why are we in this? That's how I took it anyway. Um, so a couple days later, the uh, York County solicitor sent the, the information, except for the employment start and end dates, um, to Paula, not to me. She sent it to Paula. Paula forwarded it, obviously. Um, and she sent the records with an admonition admonition that we should be careful with them um, as if, you know, I mean, I took that as an insult, frankly. So but she's also sent Paul an email claiming I acted inappropriately by reaching out to her, the solicitor, and to the county's president commissioner for comment about our court battle. Um, that was four months ago. She suggested uh, that it was inappropriate because it was pending litigation, which as reporters, we all know that we get to cover stories, that that's not the case here. Um, and she also suggested that if I did it again, it could jeopardize my working relationship with the president county commissioner. This was nothing more than an attempt to have a chilling effect on my reporting. Um, it has not worked. So, um, I mean, I'm very lucky because uh, the president of the York Dispatch, Dave Martins, is solidly behind our fight on this, uh, like Paula and, and like me. He believes it's really important to squash this right now before this kind of argument gains traction and you start seeing it all over the state. Um, also on board, who agrees with us, is uh, Terry Mutchler, who, as I'm sure, most of you know, uh, created the Office of Open Records and served as its first executive director for many years. Um, Terry and Paula are teaming up for our Commonwealth Court Appeal. They use and have used words such as ridiculous and ludicrous to describe uh, our case. And while the Reporters Committee is uh, handling our case pro bono and, and Terry's working at a reduced rate, I mean, there's still a cost. And I'm just really thankful that Dave Martins is willing to shoulder that cost. Many newspapers can't afford that, you know, and we can barely afford it, but you have to pick your battles. Um, the sad truth is without Paula and, and now Terry, I, I could not have weathered this fight to this point. The reporters everywhere are working harder. Um, our numbers are dwindling. Most of us don't have time to write legal briefs let alone the knowledge to do it well. Um, so I'm sharing my story today because I believe access to public information is under threat nationally. And um, if a request as basic and blatantly public as mine can be denied, then what else is gonna be questioned next? I mean, as we see a rise in troubling anti-media sentiment, I think it gives public officials 
um, more leeway to deny us because they feel as if the public isn't going to care. So Terry tells me that York County is one of the two worst counties in Pennsylvania at abiding by open records laws. Uh, th that's been my experience in this particular case. You know, I think it's important to say that certainly not all of York County uh, is like that. A number of county offices, especially row officers, have solid records of being open and accessible to the media. Um, and, and I think that that's because those officials understand that it's not about being nice to the reporters, although they are. Uh, in my in my experience, but it's about the fact that when they speak to me, they're really speaking to the public who elected them and the public that, that they've you know sworn to serve. So journalism remains critical in helping the citizens scrutinize what their government's doing. And Liz, we have a question. Um, Jim Parsons in the chat asked, did, did they ask you why? Um, and he said, that's my favorite question to answer. And he says, my response is usually something like, what is your social security number? Oh, none of my business, samesies. I mean, really why someone is seeking records under the right to know law doesn't matter whether it's Marissa from um, the University of Pennsylvania for research, David writes in, um, he's a regular citizen, it, you know, or if it's, you know, your cat walker or dog walker, it doesn't matter. The right to know law doesn't ask those questions. Um, and Melissa from the PNA is on our, our next panel up about the Sunshine Act. And I know Melissa, you get that question so often on the PNA hotline. So maybe you can say a word about that when you come on. But um, Liz, you know, if you had one parting comment before we go over to Angela about what you learned in this murky world of what is a judicial record, what is um, a county record, is, is there any closing advice you could offer to folks about, um, you know, what you've learned here? Well, I mean, I'm not sure it's advice. It, it you know, it, it's just my experience, I think. But, but the experience is, from my viewpoint, these records aren't judicial. They were never judicial. But if you get one official, one attorney who can try to spin some argument about how the records are judicial, um, basically they can hide them from you for months and months. And that is a great transition, Liz. Thank you so much. And um, Liz's reporting is in the chat and also in the PowerPoint, including um, her most recent reporting from this week, covering her eight month battle to get basic salary information. Um, judicial records that Liz was talking about are a narrower um, definition under the right to no, no law. Similarly, legislative records are a narrower definition under the right to no law. And Angela Columbus from Spotlight PA is going to give us a, a very short uh, and succinct <laughs> summary of what she has learned trying to get legislative records and in the PowerPoint you have some links um, to some of Angela and her colleagues reporting. Well uh, thank you Paula and um, I will try and keep this pretty quick. Um, I'm Angela Columbus, I'm a reporter with uh, Spotlight PA. We are an investigative newsroom uh, covering state government and the state capitol. Um, so I remember very succinctly uh, covering at the time the enactment of the new open records law back in 2008. And um, it was hailed as this huge victory for um, access and transparency um, and really for the public's right to know. But I realized, and many people realized pretty quickly, especially those covering the state legislature, that it had lots of limitations and that in writing the law, uh, legislators in particular sort of put themselves in a very special category and made um, you know, many exemptions for a lot of their work product that you can get when you are dealing with um, an executive agency, but you can't get um, when you're dealing with the legislature. One example of that is uh, emails and texts, which is particularly frustrating when you're a reporter because those really give you insight into um, you know, people's thinking. Um, but with the legislature, what we found is 
you know, aside from your vote, you know, your voting calendars, your copies of bills, your transcripts of public hearings and such, really financial documents are among the few records that um, the legislature is required to disclose. Um, but what we found out when uh, the caucus and, and Spotlight PA about a year ago decided that, okay, well, financial records are open. So let's see if we can document how, um, you know, the nation's largest full-time legislature here in Pennsylvania spends its uh, money every year. And we put in what we thought was a very simple right to know request uh, seeking, uh, you know, expenditures aside from salary and benefits in both the House and the Senate. Um, and we got back thousands upon thousands of pages in a format that was really difficult for us to, um, uh, to really analyze in any meaningful way. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but what we found is that they started redacting a lot of what we thought was really basic and pertinent information. And really what it was, was the descriptions, um, sort of the detailed descriptions of what these expenditures were for. Uh, so, for instance, um, we the, the House, uh, there was a House uh, member who's, who spent money on a luncheon, but you don't know for what um, or who was there or why, because that information gets blacked out. So we decided to push back with the caucus um, and we filed appeals and we filed appeals in both the House and the Senate because there were redactions. Um, in both of those uh, sets of documents. And I should back up quickly and say that in um, defending those redactions, the legislature said it, it claimed a special legislative privilege um, under the state constitution, uh, the speech and debate privilege, which uh, public records advocates have told us that the, that privilege is really used to protect speech uh, during official proceedings. It is not meant to protect how uh, the legislature spends its money. But that was the um, exemption that they were claiming. And we pushed back on it, uh, which is my tip number one is, you know, uh, you have to, you have to read very closely why uh, when somebody is denying you information, whether it's an outright denial or a redaction, uh, what their explanation is, because, um, you know, there are ways that you can successfully challenge them. So we pushed back and the other, uh, you know, the thing about the legislature is that, again, when it was writing the law, it gave itself um, in the appeals process, uh, what I like to call a legs up, because if you are appealing a denial or some sort of redaction at the executive level, uh, your, your appeal goes to an, the independent uh, office of open records. Whereas in the legislature, the appeals officers are designated by the leadership of the chambers. Um, and these people are often people who are either appointed or hired by these very leaders. So you sort of feel like, you know, they just have a leg up going into the process. But um, in, in dealing with the appeals through the, through the legislature, we found very quickly that the House worked with us um, uh, through a kind of informal mediation process, they ended up redacting, uh, unredacting a lot of what they had uh, hidden from, from us to begin with. And, you know, very quickly we found that what they were hiding was sort of this crazy trivial things like the house speaker had had a, a group of Eagle Scouts in his office. And when they had initially redacted the fact that the meeting was with Eagle Scouts and, you know, claiming that there was some sort of legislative privilege to this. So that's why, you know, I urge uh, people who have the time at the very least, if not necessarily the resources to push back on these types of things. Um, in the Senate, our appeal did not go quite as smoothly. Um, in the process of appealing, we decided to refile the public records request, which I think was a lessons learned on, on my part at least, like just don't do it because when we refiled our request, uh, what ended up happening was they uh, took the whole column of explanations and they just redact, I mean, they just took it out. They didn't even include it in their 
uh, response. Um, and they didn't explain why they were taking it out and they didn't even reveal why they decided to do so. Angela, I mean, and we're, I'm cueing the Sunshine uh, Act panel people that you're up next, but can you tell us before we close out with you, I mean, you know, in right to know requests, do you see citizens or other journalists asking legislators, the Senate, the House for records, or, or is it an area that's pretty unexplored? Um, it's, it's a little bit of both. I think that when you deal with the legislature and when you're putting in a right to know request, try and find a financial angle always because it'll give you a uh, leg up in getting actually getting the information that you're seeking. Be precise and specific, um, push back on their, uh, on their denials. And, um, you know, also in dealing with any agency, whether it's legislative or uh, in the executive, and I'm sure other panelists will tell you this, there is a little bit of a give and forth, of, uh, back and forth and give and take um, in, the, in the process of trying to get the information. And you should be willing to have conversations with the very people you are trying to get the information from, even though that relationship can be adversarial, but often you can work out resolutions right then and there on the spot. Um, uh, and, you know, the other, the other, and I know there were some other panelists who, who talk about, who talked about not being overly specific, but um, we've found in requests to the legislature, specificity has been key to getting information um, from, an, you know, a government body that is, is really difficult to get public information from. Thank you so much, Angela. And this panel, the Right to Know panel, is going to go off screen now. They're going to come back for our question and answer period. But now we're transitioning and flipping over to our Sunshine Act panel. So thank you so much. We'll see you in a little bit, Right to Know panel. Um, for our first Sunshine um, Act panelist, we have Melissa Maluski from the Pennsylvania News Media Association. I know many of you are, are familiar with her from calling the Pennsylvania News Media Hotline. Um, so media, uh, we've asked Melissa just to give us a very broad overview. What is the Sunshine Act and um, why should we be interested in it? And I want to make sure I plug, you will be having your own um, Sunshine Week event later on this week, uh, Thursday, I think, talking specifically about the Sunshine Act. So, um, Melissa. Yes, if anybody wants to know more than the bird's eye view, which I'm going to give you today about the law in five minutes, um, I'm going to do a whole hour on Thursday with the PNA Foundation. It's free, it's open to anyone who's interested. I'll give you all the details then um, about the law itself. Um, so please, please, please feel free to avail yourself of that uh, session. It should be good. And I'll also be joined by Liz Wagenseller, who is the new executive director of the Office of Open Records. And we're very happy to have her there to weigh in as well. Um, but like Paula said, well, first I'll just briefly weigh on the, the issue Paula asked me to touch on um, about, can they ask you what you want in the right to know law context? Can they ask? Sure, they can ask you, but you don't have to answer. You don't have to tell them why you want records. You certainly can if you want to and you think it will be helpful. Um, and it's always a good idea to try to have a, a, a positive working relationship with the government agencies that you're trying to deal with. Sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you have very good reasons that you will not or should not tell them why you're looking for records and that is fine. The law expressly says they cannot deny your request for your refusal to tell them why you want a record. So just briefly touch on that again. And please be specific in the right to know law when you make requests, because if you're not, they will deny you. And I hear that every single day from journalists across the state. Be as specific as you can. And like our first panelist said, avoid legalese, any and all, including but not limited to. Those are invitations for specificity denial. Don't do it. Um, but hopping to Pennsylvania's public meetings law, that's the Sunshine Act. So, um, and I'm gonna cover just the very basics today. Um, Pennsylvania Sunshine Act is the primary public access law that governs public meetings and it was first enacted in 1957 and it's gone through a series of updates since then, most recently in 2018. Um, the law guarantees the public's right to witness and participate in government deliberation and decision making. 
And it applies broadly to agencies across the Commonwealth, including the General Assembly, the executive branch, and state and local policy making bodies like school boards, borough councils, county commissioners, um, uh, municipal authorities, they're all covered by the Sunshine Act. Um, the General Assembly is covered a little bit differently than your other types of uh, local and state agencies, but they are covered. Um, the law also applies to any committees of an agency that are authorized to render advice or take official action on behalf of their larger board. And I hear that question all the time um, from journalists. You know, they say things like, well, the school board has a personnel committee, but it meets privately or the the um, the prison the prison board has a uh, safety and security policy or committee, but that it meets privately. Committees are covered by the act and they are agencies themselves for purposes of the Sunshine Act. So if they are rendering advice or taking official action on agency business, they are agencies themselves and are, and are required to hold public meetings. So the general rule, when does the Sunshine Act apply? So you've got an agency, here's the general rule that applies. Anytime an agency quorum deliberates agency business or takes official action, it must do so at a public meeting. Now, there are limited exceptions that allow some deliberation to occur outside a public meeting, the executive sessions, for example, but official actions or votes, that can only take place at a public meeting and only after there's been an opportunity for public comment. Um, the law also provides several affirmative requirements that agencies have to follow when they're holding a public meeting. So for example, they have to provide advance notice of the date, time, and location of public meetings. They have to keep official minutes of all public meetings. And there are certain things that have to be part of those minutes, including the date, time, location, the names of all members present, um, the name of all people who gave public comment and the subject of their testimony, um, and the votes, a, a record of the roll call votes. Agencies also have to provide a meaningful opportunity for public comment at every public meeting and before all votes. So if you have an agency that has public meeting at the beginning and they say, you know, public meeting, we're going to public comment on anything that's on the agenda, but then halfway through the meeting, a new issue comes up that they want to vote on. If that new issue, if there was no opportunity to comment on it at the beginning when public comment took place, the board has to open up the meeting for more public comment before they can take any official action on that new item. Um, they also have to allow anyone in attendance to record public meetings. Um, there's a lot of tension with regard to the right to record. The statute says expressly the right to record attaches to the entire public meeting. Anyone present can record as much or as little of the meeting as they want, and that is audio and or video. Um, you don't need permission from the agency to do that. The law already gives it to you. Um, if someone objects to you recording the meeting, too bad, so sad for them. I mean, ultimately the law allows you and expressly grants the right to record public meetings. So if someone doesn't like that, their option is they cannot provide public comment at a public meeting. And Melissa, every now and then we do hear about public meetings where police come in or some public official says, there's the wiretap in Pennsylvania, stop recording. What, yeah. What's your uh, response about that when you hear that on the hotline? I hear that occasionally and, and I have had journalists been threatened with arrest and charge criminal charges under the wiretap act. The wiretap act is Pennsylvania's law that it makes it, we're, we're a two party consent state, which means that you have to have someone's permission to record their voice anytime there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. The Wiretap Act does not apply where there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. There is no reasonable expectation of privacy at a public meeting for two reasons. One, because you're in public, and two, because the Sunshine Act already provides affirmative notice that public meetings can be recorded. So if you have a public official or a law enforcement uh, officer saying threatening wiretap sanctions because of recording public meetings, that illustrates a fundamental misunderstanding of the Wiretap Act and when and where it applies. Um, if you're a PNA member or journalist, I'm happy to talk you through that issue. Um, we've written letters uh, uh, of advice on that. Uh, the law is pretty clear. I think it's just misunderstood. Um, the, uh, the law, the Sunshine Act, and I think some of our later panelists are going to touch on this in more detail, is a, is a citizen enforced law. It allows civil legal challenges and criminal legal action against individual elected officials, but there is no Office of Open Records for enforcement of the Sunshine Act. The Office of Open Records provides training on the law, 
but they don't have enforcement action. That, they can't say, yes, this was a violation or no, it wasn't. And there's no, um, there's no oversight agency either. So if you think something has gone wrong as a person, as a citizen who's attended a public meeting, your only option is to file a lawsuit in civil court and or file a private criminal complaint against individual elected officials. There's no government agency that oversees the Sunshine Act and its compliance. It is a citizen enforced law. Um, obviously pursuing civil actions requires a lawsuit. Uh, in the Court of Common Pleas for local agencies, if you wanted to sue the General Assembly or a, a, the governor's office or a state level agency like the Workers' Compensation Board, those actions would be filed in Commonwealth Court. Criminal sanctions can be pursued by filing a private criminal complaint with a district attorney. The district attorney ultimately makes the decision on whether or not criminal charges are appropriate, but the private criminal complaint is something that doesn't require, law, doesn't require a lawyer and will provide some measure of oversight because the district attorney's office has to investigate all private criminal complaints. Um, like I said before, the Office of Open Records provides training on the Sunshine Act, but they do not have any enforcement power. Um, if you find yourself in court and successful, uh, there are civil penalties for violating the act that include invalidation of official action. So the court can throw out that contract that was authorized behind closed doors. Uh, a court can enter an injunction that can require certain conduct or prohibit certain conduct by public officials or public agencies. There are also financial penalties like legal fee reimbursement and attorney's fees, costs and um, associated with civil litigation. On the criminal side, I'm only aware of three-ish in the past 15 years, uh, incidents of criminal penalties actually being uh, imposed as a result of Sunshine Act violations. It is a summary offense to violate the Sunshine Act. For a first offense, the minimum fine is 100 or up to $1,000 plus the cost of prosecution. For second and subsequent offenses, the cost, the fine is up to $2,000 again, plus court fees and costs. And again, enforcement, and you'll hear about this more from the other Sunshine Act panelists, enforcement is very difficult because most people don't have the time or the money to pursue complex civil litigation in a court of law. And the, the, the burdens that are associated with litigation are compounded by the fact that the Sunshine Act requires you, the citizen, the challenger, to bear the burden of proof to show that, it, that an executive session violated the law, the Sunshine Act was violated in some other manner. That's a very difficult burden to meet because you don't have any information about a meeting you were excluded from. Melissa, that is an excellent transition. Unless you have one more pressing thing to say, I'm trying to keep us on target. Oh, with no, time. Sure. Let me just say one thing. The Sunshine Act, like the right to know law, is not a confidentiality statute. It never requires executive sessions. It allows them in certain limited circumstances, but it is a public access law. So it's important to come at this discussion with that as your basis. It is a public access law, not a confidentiality statute. Thank you, Melissa. And Melissa will go into much more on Thursday. Please check out the link in the chat. And it was a great transition over to Michelle Grove, who is in fact a citizen activist and member of the Pennsylvania Freedom of Information Coalition, our co-host in today's event. And Michelle, I know you could probably talk for the entire day about your struggles with Sunshine Act compliance, but I do want to note that we are a little behind on time, so I will keep keep us um, on task here. So if you want to present us with your high level uh, overview, we do have a link to your court opinion and um, kind of some of the facts about what happened in the PowerPoint that will go out later. So tell us about what happened in Center County. So um, in Center County, uh, the school board for my, where I live, which is Penns Valley Area School Board, um, in 2018, there was a rumor going around that they purchased a farm next to the school for $1.2 million, and this was never mentioned in any, any public meeting. So I had filed some right to know requests to try to find out exactly what happened, and the school district announced that they purchased the land. After that, um, they had a special meeting where they voted basically to ratify the purchase that was never discussed in public that was already um, made. So this was over a million dollars again. So my husband and I um, 
attended some meetings. We recorded them, which I highly recommend doing anytime you go to a public meeting. We recorded them. We filed right to knows. We sent emails. Um, we sent them training for the Sunshine Act. We made public comments um, discussing various case law, um, specifically the Reading case primarily. And they, um, so the school board where I live, they, they go into executive session a lot. And when I filed a right to know request to find out about when they made the decision to purchase the land, what they sent me back was minutes where they highlighted the word legal. And so what this school board does is when they go into executive session, which sometimes they do more than once in a meeting, they will just give you all the categories that they can claim. So they'll say, we're going to go into an executive session for legal personnel contract. They just list off everything and they have acknowledged on video and um, during testimony uh, for the case I'm, I'm going to talk about that it's their standard practice to do this to just, just to give all the categories and then discuss whatever they want. So obviously a citizen has no idea what's going on now. The Sunshine Act, if, if there is a violation of the Sunshine Act that happens outside of a public meeting, we have 30 days from discovery and within a year. However, if they won't tell you what, what they did or when they did it, you can't discover it and the burden is on the citizen. So we went through that process trying to do that. And ultimately we filed um, a complaint. Um, our county DA does not get involved in Sunshine Act enforcement. It's their policy that a citizen has a legal remedy to do it themselves. And so that's what we've been doing. So we filed a complaint first about the executive sessions not being described with any specificity. There were uh, pre preliminary objections as to the way we serve the complaint. Um, they claim they had a high public official immunity and, and also that the penalty could not be applied because it was a civil case, not criminal. So we went through several rounds of that. This has been going on now for a few years. We went through depositions where we, my husband and I were asked how many kids we have, if they go to the school, if uh, we go around suing people, if anyone's giving us money, that sort of thing. It was pretty ridiculous. Um, and basically we went through all these legal jumps for years. We had, um, we had a motion to the school, the school board's attorney filed a motion to preclude us from introducing our videos because the videos that we have, the school board is um, describing that it's their longstanding practice to just give all the categories and not tell people which ones that they're going into the meeting for. Um, in the videos, they said that they would not allow public comments at what they call work sessions, but that they do deliberate at work sessions. We had videos of work sessions where they were forming a committee and making various um, decisions, just not doing it as a formal vote, but still accomplishing the same end. And so during this process, uh, we were ordered to amend our complaint and we added some additional things that had come up um, due to the timeliness, you have, you know, you only have 30 days. And it became a, a battle basically to get things to get things um, tossed for timeliness, to not get the videos in. They said that the videos couldn't be authenticated, that they basically couldn't couldn't prove or couldn't agree that it was a legitimate video. Um, and Michelle, that, this whole time you're you're proceeding along, you don't have a lawyer. You're just you and your husband are proceeding. No, no lawyer, no lawyer. So so I have a lot of uh, court cases, mostly right to know where I do not have a lawyer. And I would just note you are the Michelle Grove of the wonderful uh, Grove Supreme Court um, body camera case that actually yes. was a great decision and then was later undone by Act 22 that her Ruby talked about earlier. Yes, within so. days, within days. Yeah, I was, I was a little triggered hearing, hearing that. I always get a little... <laughs> It really upsets me that that I'm happened. But your one minute warning, Michelle. So do you want to sure, tell us sure. what? So, so what the point that we're at right now with this, so the judge um, ultimately did uh, put out an opinion and order. The videos did get in. We went in and authenticated them through testimony. The videos that we took were at meetings that were not at their normal meeting place. And so we basically authenticated them by saying, what is this place? 
okay, here's a list of all your meetings. How many meetings did you have at this place? Oh, only one. So this meeting was at that place on this date. Yes. Okay. So we got the videos in the judge decided that they could just give all the categories. They didn't have to be specific that they did not have to allow public comment at work sessions that they did not have to keep minutes of work sessions. And we filed a notice of appeal because the way that we the way that we remedy these problems is is through case law, as you as you guys probably all know. And so I filed a notice of appeal. And as of right now, I have to file a statement of errors. And um, at this point, we are still pro se to do that. And so this is an ongoing thing. And so what I've learned, the advice that I have for everyone is to video record anytime you go to a public meeting, make sure you video record it. Try to video record something that shows what day it is, maybe the agenda or something, because that's an issue that can come up. And make sure that you have tried every way possible to get the information because the burden is on the citizen to prove that there was a violation. And this school board actually at one point tried to get us to pay their legal fees, um, which were quite large, saying that this was a frivolous complaint, which it was not. And so that's the stage we're at right now. And hopefully I don't drop the ball and hopefully we get some good case law out of the Commonwealth Court on this because it needs to happen. Thank you so much, Michelle. Her, um, Amelia has placed in the chat a link to the Court of Common Pleas decision. And Melissa, if I could have you um, uh, drop a link to what uh, Michelle was talking about. There are only certain reasons why an agency can go into executive session. They're very limited. Um, and the agency must announce, and they can't just say a laundry list of, we're going legal personnel contract. You know, there has to be some discrete information. So Melissa, if you have a, a PNA resource you can drop, or maybe an off, Office of Open Records link, just so people know what those limited um, exceptions are, we're going to move on to Shane. And Michelle has just shared with us the difficulty of the citizen-driven attempt to enforce the Sunshine Act. Shane, tell us a little bit about your experience um, with the criminal side of things. It's very much in line with, with what you just asked Melissa to, to drop a link in and is a, not being transparent about what they're doing in the executive session. So when I came here from Texas in uh, the summer of 2013, I was pretty aghast at, at how, um, uh, how much the county commissioners in particular flouted the open records, open meetings and uh, laws uh, in the state. And uh, it was just a default to, uh, no, uh, we're not gonna give you that. And it came to a head in February of 2014 when we actually filed a criminal complaint uh, against uh, the Beaver County commissioners uh, for uh, you know, not announcing what they were gonna talk about at executive session for a prison board and for two workshops where the workshops were where they were making all the decisions and then they come into the, you know, the commission meeting and it would be a five minute process to you know, vote yes or no on whatever had come up and all that work is being done. So we, we challenged that and uh, we ended up settling about six weeks later, we had a meeting with the, with the county commissioners and uh, it was pretty, uh, to this day, I, I have regrets about settling that and not pursuing that further because I, I don't know that it resonated uh, with them. We, we, had, we had a good case to go and our, our legal team had felt like if we wanted to continue to pursue it, we would uh, just because they were flouting the, the law so much uh, about what it was. It's very clear as Melissa, I haven't looked at the link that Melissa put in, but they weren't specific. There's no specificity at all to it. And then it was a cultural issue in Beaver County too, because it you know, came across in the right to know law. And after we settled it, it got a little bit better, uh, but it, it didn't go away. There was a change in the commissioners, two new commissioners come in in 2017. Uh, they fired their solicitor and, and several other folks without a, a public meeting, which is uh, required by law. And, uh, you know, and, and it was pervasive everywhere too, uh, is in open government. We had a public defense, a story about a public defender who in the course of our reporting, allegedly only had sent 104 emails in, two, in a two year period as the lead public defender of Beaver County. And so they had policies, you know, such policies as, you know, read and delete uh, on their emails. And, 
uh, you couldn't, it was just pervasive in there. So when you see that, that kind of thing in the, I guess my counsel would be when you see flouting the open government, open meetings laws like Beaver County did, um, it's probably symptomatic of something greater within, within the system there. So I know we're going to keep it brief there, but uh, you know, the settling of that, uh, you know, and I think one point that Melissa made too, there's not a lot of teeth to a criminal complaint either, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars and maybe some legal fees, you know, that, that's the price of doing business for some. And, you know, I, I think you have to be pretty steadfast about it, but uh, I'm glad we dug our heels in to some degree. If nothing else, it showed the staff that we weren't going to uh, take, take this lying down. Uh, but it's not too much to ask for, for those explanations. And, and they did get better about it when it was convenient for them, when they didn't want to let let the public know it was a little, we had to remind them that, that uh, you know, that law was on the books and it's been hit or miss. I've been gone for a few years from now, but at the time I was there, uh, that's how that went. So and I know she, we're short on time, I'll, I'll leave it there. That, that's great. And we have the link to um, some of the coverage from the Beaver County Times criminal, private criminal complaint against the commissioners. That will be be in the PowerPoint later, but you know Shane and that instance um, show a situation where the criminal side did have impact. There, as Melissa said, there are very few criminal cases in the state. One of them was in Lancaster County, involving um, a grand jury that was impaneled to look at some Sunshine Act issues and other issues, and ultimately resulted in three county commissioners pleading guilty to summary offenses. Um, for the Sunshine Act violations. But again, the criminal um, side of things is rare. So it's good to highlight uh, what, what happened in your case, Shane, because it's, it's a possibility. So we're gonna turn over for our last Sunshine Act panelist is Stacy from uh, Walford from the Mon Valley Independent. And you're going to lift our spirits here, Stacy, with some good news about the Sunshine Act and a court case. Thank you so much. And um, I'm so, so happy to be here. And I am happy that my story is a successful one. And um, so I'm pretty proud to be able to share it with everybody here today. So just to summarize quickly, um, in January 2020, um, we're a community newspaper focusing on hyper local news. We cover school boards, you know, council meetings, and that sort of thing. And um, in January 2020, we covered a reorganization meeting for the, the city of Manassan. Um, the mayor, after a nearly two-year absence of not coming to meetings, presented a, an agenda to the public, and then he pulled the old switcheroo and had his own agenda, which was not presented to the public to comment on, and council then went and uh, fired the city solicitor, fired the city administrator, and went down the line. Um, so we recorded that meeting as part of you know what we do we have on a youtube channel we record various meetings now um so we decided after that meeting you know we weren't gonna you know sit down and just let this happen to the community and we decided to file a civil lawsuit so in uh, june we went before westmoreland county common police judge harry f smell jr and we presented our case and we had the video to back us up we had a copy of both agendas which is another a good tip, you know, have your reporters keep those agendas, grab what you can and hang on to them because, you know, it is important. And then, um, of course, the pandemic hit. So fast forward to December 2020. And, you know, of course, we're, you know, constantly going to the, the Common Police website looking for, you know, our case. Did it happen? What happened? You know, and we got a little nervous about it as time went on. But fortunately for us, in uh, December 11th, 2020, Judge Smell ruled in our favor that the city and the mayor did violate the Sunshine Act and found that when council went to ratify it, they violated it again because enough, the public, again, didn't have a chance to comment on it. Um, so the, the judge ordered the city and the mayor to comply with all the Sunshine Act provisions, and they also ordered them to attend Sunshine Act training through the state's Office of Open Records. Um, so we were pretty proud of that. You know, as a small community newspaper, that was a pretty big feather in our cap. And really what we wanted to prove is that, you know, we're the watchdog for our communities and we're gonna you know, do what we can to protect the citizens, excuse me, citizens and push for open government and transparency. So we're pretty proud of that. 
Stacy, do you know if if they have completed the training with the Office of Open Records? They have. They have 30 days to do it, so they have. And I can also say, you know, talking with our other community leaders, it also sent a message throughout the Mon Valley, in which we cover that, you know, hey, you know, we need to advertise these meetings. You know, we've had some other community leaders step out and say, hey, you know, we is this right? Are we following the Sunshine Act rules? So it's caused some other towns to pause to think about what they're doing. And so for, for us, that, that really means a lot. That's fantastic. And the link to the coverage from the Mon Valley Independent is in the chat. It will also be in the PowerPoint and the order from the judge is also in the chat and will be in the PowerPoint. And Melissa put in the chat, thank you so much, Melissa, those very limited reasons for going into executive session and also um, the case that uh, Michelle referred to, the Reading Eagle case is in the chat as well. And Melissa, do you wanna say 30 seconds about the Reading Eagle case? Sure, the Reading Eagle case is a Commonwealth Court decision and it is precedential. And what it says, it dealt with an executive session that dealt with litigation. And what the court found in that case was at a minimum, the agency has to announce the docket number, party names, and the court in which a pending lawsuit is filed to justify a litigation executive session. If we're talking about threatened litigation, uh, at a minimum, they have to announce the nature of the legal complaint. Now, we don't really have guidance, um, specific guidance on the other six executive sessions, personnel, um, real estate, collective bargaining, um, uh, confidential by law and safety and security, but um, we do have language in the Reading Eagle case that makes it clear that agencies have to provide real discrete reasons justifying excluding the public because that's the only shot the public has at understanding why they were excluded and seeking redress if they were excluded inappropriately. So just saying real estate, personnel, litigation, that does not meet the legal standard. That is deficient as a matter of law. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Sunshine Act panel. We've got um, Gunita on the phone. She's having some internet issues, but she is going to lead us in a speed FOIA. And I will just say to the attendees, um, we had a question in the chat. Someone wondered, have any of you had experience using the Freedom of Information Act? So this is the federal law that Gunita is going to talk about um, on distribution of CARES money. There you are. You're here. Um, so if you have covered it or you're um, somebody who's been interested in that, if you drop that in the chat, we'd love to hear about your FOIA experience with CARES Act money. Gunita, go. Hi, everyone. I was having some technical difficulties, but here I am. Uh, in the 10 minutes or less, I'll go at lightning speed uh, that we have together. I'm just hoping to get you all excited about using the federal Freedom of Information Act. Um, and, and figuring out how you can use it when covering both national and local stories. So just super quickly, what is the federal FOIA? It was passed in 1966. It provides a statutory right of access to records in the possession of federal executive branch agencies. So earlier we were talking about the Pennsylvania right to know law, but now we're just gonna switch gears and move on to the federal side of things for just a few minutes. So under the federal FOIA, you can essentially ask almost any executive branch agency for records on a wide spectrum of government activities. And even though FOIA applies to the federal government, as I just said, it absolutely has relevance to local issues and local reporting. So just to kind of plant some seeds and, and get the gears turning a little bit, you know, maybe you are writing about militarization of local police. You know, the Defense Logistics Agency of the Federal Department of Defense may have information about the provision of weapons and other equipment to local Pennsylvania law enforcement. Or maybe you're interested in learning about the opioid epidemic or other drug related issues affecting your state. Maybe the Drug Enforcement Administration or the NIH or even the VA are candidates of federal agencies that might be relevant to your local reporting. Maybe you're exploring industrialized animal agriculture, given the presence of hog farming in Pennsylvania. You know, think of the, the EPA or the USDA as potentially relevant federal agencies. So I say all of this just to drive the point home that FOIA is for everyone, whether you're a journalist or an activist, all of the folks in this virtual room can use FOIA to better their understanding of the operations of government 
and to help enable others to do the same. So if you have decided that FOIA is the route that you want to take, if all of this piques your interest, um, take a look at the FOIA wiki, which I anticipate uh, Amelia is going to drop in the chat. That's FOIA.wiki, easy to remember. It can in case you're curious and want to nerd out a little bit on some legislative history to really specific strategies for, you know, appealing FOIA exemptions or everything in between. So it's a great resource for learning the ins and outs of the federal FOIA, including how to craft a strong request, which I'll just spend a moment focusing on right now, because some of these tips are, are really universally applicable and will come in handy for your right to know law requests as well. So tip number one, Think carefully about your word choices. As a general rule, and I know Angela and Melissa touched on this earlier, ask precisely for what you need. And that's because there does tend to be a trade-off between the scope of the records that you're seeking and the timeliness of your response. So absolutely consider using keywords, dates, individuals, all of the background information that you have at your disposal as limiting factors. And a trusty tip is to, um, after you've written your request, try reading it from the perspective of the records officer and ask yourself whether it's clear. Because remember with federal FOIA, these records officers are getting dozens, if not more FOIA requests a day. And you really just want to hold their hand through this process and make it as clear uh, and unambiguous as possible for them. So tip number two, you can specify the format that you want the records in. So don't hesitate to say that you want your records in electronic format or you know, in native Excel spreadsheet format. We've worked with journalists where the records office will print out an Excel spreadsheet and then the requester has to piece it together like a puzzle, which is just so inefficient. So save yourself some time and specify the formats that you, the format that you want your records requests or that you want your records in rather. And finally, tip number three, uh, address fees in your request. Maybe you're a member of the news media or you're affiliated with a scientific or academic institution, you may be entitled to a fee benefit. So to check out the statutory requirements to make sure you qualify for those fee benefits, definitely go to the FOIA wiki, foia.wiki, which is absolutely going to be your North Star throughout the whole FOIA process, whether you're a novice or an old hat at FOIA. And just super quickly um, regarding next steps after you send in your FOIA request, the agency technically has 20 business days to make a determination about uh, what the agency will produce or withhold, but newsflash, it almost never works that efficiently. So be prepared for some delays, but once again, go to the FOIA wiki for some tips and tricks for navigating those delays and pinging the agency into compliance. Um, so that is the FOIA process in a lightning bolt for you. But just to wrap up, I do want to spend just one more moment talking about how the administration of FOIA has been affected over the last year during the pandemic, because it's really been a mixed bag. Um, Congress didn't change any of FOIA's deadlines in response to COVID, right? The only way for the federal statute to be amended is if Congress does that, but it didn't. But that said, federal agencies have exhibited um, many different responses to requests over the last 12 months. Some agencies fortunately didn't show any changes to their FOIA protocols, but others like the FBI and the State Department severely limited or, or suspended their FOIA operations. Um, this time last year, the FBI for almost a month dismantled its electronic FOIA portal. Uh, the State Department also essentially suspended its FOIA operations, claiming a a 96% reduction in its ability to process FOIA requests. But fortunately, the State Department is up and running again. The FBI's FOIA office is only operating at 50% capacity right now, but hopefully all federal FOIA offices will resume normal operations in the coming weeks and months. Um, and to, fi to finish things off on a bright note, because it is Sunshine Week and there is a lot to celebrate, we have seen tremendous FOIA successes over the last year. Um, the Washington Post, for example, used FOIA to access a State Department cable showing that the White House had no hard proof whatsoever to back up its claims that COVID-19 had um, been released by a Chinese laboratory. 
Uh, over the summer, the New York Times filed a FOIA lawsuit, the result of which was um, records from the CDC showing that Latina, Latino, and Black residents of the U.S. have been three times as likely to become infected um, with COVID-19 compared to non-persons of color. So these have all been really critical stories for understanding the nature uh, and toll of this pandemic, and they really drive home the point of, of what we can accomplish when we take advantage of FOIA to to better illuminate important issues that affect us every day. So that is FOIA in a nutshell. It's a mixed bag, but I definitely wanted to end with some success stories for you all. That's fantastic, Ganita, thank you. And to be clear, you mentioned some national outlets, but people all over the country can utilize FOIA, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. All right, so we are close to or bumping up against our time. So I think we'll take Four questions as a reminder, all the information in the chat, links to all the opinions we've talked about will be distributed. This recording will be distributed. So if you wanna share it with the newsroom, um, fellow citizens, please do. Um, but is there a burning question? I believe we have all our panelists here. If you want to drop it in the chat, um, we'll, we'll take about four to five questions. And it's it's dead silent. <laughs> oh, thank you. Marissa dropped a link in the chat about the blue book that she talked about. Um, Gunita, can you talk about FOIA reading rooms? What is that? Sure. So a lot of federal agencies will post um, previously re released records online. So the FBI's, for example, is called the Vault. These are helpful places to go to if you're trying to see what's already been released from federal agencies to records requesters in the past. Um, it can be a good option to consult those before reinventing the wheel, so to speak, if you want to see what's already been requested and produced. It can also be a good, uh, good way to brainstorm to see, okay, this has already been produced, but how can I build off of it? You know, are there still unanswered questions based on these record productions that I can then build off of in my reporting? So reading rooms, if you go to, you know, almost any federal agency website in their FOIA um, section, you should most likely be able to find their reading room as well. There are some and, state, I'm sorry, Paula, go ahead. No, you, you were going to say what I think I was going to okay. say. Go ahead. There are some state equivalents to FOIA reading rooms at, and under Pennsylvania's right to know law, there's the pen watch system, which provides affirmative public access to um, salary and budgetary information for Commonwealth level agencies. And then there's also the treasury website. Um, it's not, it's not just the treasury's information. It's all state contracts over $5,000 have to be on the on a, a database that's administered via the Department of Treasury's website. Um, so you can go there and look at all state contracts that are valued over $5,000 and it's a wealth of information. Um, and I suggest you go there to check it out. And in addition to that, I mean, and the same with FOIA, um, some of our reporters mentioned it earlier. Um, if you can avoid the right to know law process, please do. If you can get access from a source or outside the context of the legal mechanisms that go on inside the right to know law, take advantage of that. There's no law that says you have to use the right to know law to get access to records. If you want to go into your borough council and say, hey, can I have a copy of the minutes? You can do that. COVID makes that a little tough right now, but there's no, there's no reason you have to get involved with the formal mechanisms of the law if you don't have to. Some, some requests you will have to, like Marissa's, for example, with 1,200 law enforcement agencies. There's no way to do that without the formality of the right to know law. Um, but in many circumstances, like Liz at the York, the York Dispatch, she should have been able to just walk into the prothonotary's office or the county comptroller and say, hey, I want to know who works for the county prothonotary, what are their names, how much have they paid, and how long have they been there? And Angela, for, from the legislature's perspective, you know, we've been talking about FOIA reading rooms and some state agencies have information proactively available. Do, do legislators have that information proactively available about their um, financial practices? Um, they have certain information about bills and, uh, you know, voting records available on their website. But if you are looking for strict financial information about expenditures, whether it's, you know, on office furniture or legal bills, no, there is absolutely no transparency on that on, on the website. And you do usually have to request it through a right, a right to know request. 
And in our PowerPoint, um, there is a link to some other resources. Melissa Watch mentioned PenWatch. Um, the Pennsylvania e-contracts portal is available for contracts over $5,000 um, if an agency posts that contract. Um, and, and the Department of State has a number of uh, resources. So there are other places to look for documents. And I think Juliet uh, mentioned that, you know, if you could get something from a source other than, um, you know, a right to know request, sometimes it's faster. And we have a question in the chat, and I think we'll take one more after this um, about right to know law litigation at the common pleas level. And is it okay for a president judge to unilaterally recuse all common pleas judges without notifying the, litig the litigants? Um, typically when there's a recusal, people know that there's been a recusal made. And so I find that to be a little bit unusual. Um, and again, this is kind of just globally on the issue of open courts. What happens in a courthouse, whether it's in the courthouse proceedings or in the records, we have a, a common law right of access to the court records. Um, so whether you're a citizen or a journalist, you should know what's happening in a courthouse. And in COVID times, courts have taken different ways of making this happen, whether it's virtual proceedings, um, some courts have uh, live stream proceedings. Some courts are, are emailing out records to litigants when they ask, but kind of the big picture here, David, in, in response to that question is what happens in a courthouse should be public. And whether it's for a litigant or other people, it is in the very rare circumstances that things are sealed or not made available to the public. And Melissa, I don't know if you had a tag on to that. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you want to know how the court spends its money, that's a right to know slash rule 509 issue. But if you want to know, like Paul said, what's filed in a court, what's happening before a judge in a hearing, that's all required to be public under the constitutional presumption of access under state and the federal constitution, as well as common law. So um, there are some um, sticking points under the UJS, the Unified Judicial Systems Public Access Policy that prohibits access um, to some information, like you don't get social security numbers, for example, in a court record, those are redacted out. But the general rule is if it's been filed in a court or a judge is considering it as part of their decision making process, it's a public record with some very rare exceptions. And the Pennsylvania, our co host here, the Pennsylvania Freedom of Information Coalition, Susan, if you're still on the call, I don't know if you have any information, you keep kind of more citizen side complaints. Um, but David is asking, what is the path to address the courts being bad actors with handling of RTK cases? Susan, can you just talk about your um, the Freedom of Information Coalition resources or kind of chat network for these kinds of questions? And for these kinds of questions, I mean, you're always welcome, David, to, to, to send us an email and then we can go and forward that to some of the attorneys that we have as part of the coalition and ask them. Unfortunately, we're not able to actually provide you with an attorney. And the problem with the court system really is that you're just stuck appealing to a higher court. If a court is acting as a bad actor, you have to appeal to the next level of court and hope that the next level of court will tell the, you know, will, will rule in your favor and tell the lower level to, to you know, to, to correct their what they did wrong and to sin no more, um, but, it, but it's that's what we did hard. in the Beaver County case. Is it had gotten uh, to the point where we were going to go to the next level there, and so you want to sit down and talk about this, or do you want to go to go to that next level of court? And they sat down and, and talked with us there. So it, it is an option, uh, but it can be a bit painful for sure. If you if you have if you have complaints about a specific judge's compliance with the rules of judicial conduct. There is a, um, a, a, an oversight body for judicial officers. It's called the Judicial Judicial Conduct Board. And you can file a complaint with that board as well. Um, or that really deals with not necessarily what happens in a case. It, it can deal with what happens in a case, but it's about a judge's behavior and whether or not they're following the rules for judicial conduct, which is a whole series of rules that judges have to follow when they, um, when they become judges. The same thing applies to attorneys. You know, there's the, the attorney disciplinary board that handles complaints about attorneys acting inappropriately. So the Judicial Conduct Board is for judges, the Attorney um, Disciplinary Board is for uh, attorneys. Okay, and the last question goes to Charlie who asks, do any of the panelists have experience with requesting records that are stored in the cloud 
For instance, I've caught PA officials exchanging Dropbox files with the private organization. The agency refused to retrieve the records. This is a great question, Charlie. As technology evolves, um, and our right to know law here in Pennsylvania says that we have access regardless of the format in which the thing is stored, whether it's social media, text message, a video. Um, what do we do about things like Dropbox or shared file services? Anyone? I, they're public. I mean, the, the right to know law by the plain plain language of the statute said if, if information is in the possession, custody or control of a public agency, it's presumptively public. So the fact that it's in a Dropbox or a Google Doc or stored on the cloud doesn't matter. The agency has an affirmative legal duty to provide public access to it as long as it's not an exempt record. Anyone else? I just want to thank all of you who are watching this now or maybe watching this later for joining us with the Reporters Committee in the Pennsylvania Freedom of Information Coalition. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists for sharing your tips and tricks and experiences. And we will hope uh, for more sunshine success stories in 2022. So thank you for all of your work and take care.